of something. So welcome those of you who are here in person and those who are online over there somewhere. Um, I'm Erica Shadok, I'm one of the pulmonologists, and I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Viv Naidu, who is our most recent um, permanent pulmonology consultant, the first since, 20, since 2007. So we're obviously <laughs> very excited to have you on board. Um, and he's been an integral part of helping us get through um, at the moment. Um, so Viv's main interest, or I don't know if it was just thrust upon you, Viv, I'm not sure, um, is, is interventional pulmonology, and he's doing a great, great job um, driving our e-bus. So if anybody has anything interesting that they think we can get to with the bronchoscope, Viv's your man. Um, but today he's going to discuss with us the most recent updated guidelines. And we all know how impossible it is even to keep up with your own guidelines in your own speciality, let alone across all of internal medicine. So I think this gives us an opportunity, even for those who are not in pulmonology, to get up to date and see what has changed or what has stayed the same. Thanks for both you. Um, all right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for all those who have attended in person as well as those online. Um, just a quick advert to unfortunately, you won't be able to skip. Um, our pulmonology CME is taking place on the 6th of May. It's currently an in-person, but we are hoping to switch it to a hybrid depending on uh, sponsorship that we get. Uh, we've got a really wonderful lineup of speakers as well as topics that will be covered. It's just across the road at the education campus, and it's not directed only at pulmonologists. I think it is a great general overview of a lot of important uh, topics in pulmonology. So please scan the QR code to join, or you can uh, just email Chipo on the email address listed below or contact her. All right. So I think as Dr. Shadok had alluded to, you know, every year we invest a lot of time and effort in learning guidelines, only for them to change every year. And I think for us, especially in pulmonology, we're golden. And Gina updating their guidelines yearly, uh, you know, it does become a bit difficult to keep up. So perhaps change is always not that good. Um, I think the only speciality that really is interested in change is or gets excited is a psychiatrist every time the new DSM comes out. So I am going to give a very overview of the important updates as well as the important, uh, let's say, points in the new COPD guidelines for 2023. I really want to focus on the why rather than the what, because I think as physicians, we shouldn't be asking, what can I do for my patient? But rather, we should be asking, why am I doing it? Because understanding of disease uh, plays a lot more or much bigger role than we, we think in terms of um, managing diseases. And hopefully, we don't end up like this gentleman over here who's auscultating a model of the heart, hoping to um, hear heart sounds. So as with all topics, we obviously need to start off with a definition. So what is COPD? So it's a traumatic disease with chronic respiratory symptoms that affects the airways, as well as the alveoli. And this, I think, in recent years has become much more evident and often has progressive airflow obstruction. There's this new terminology being thrown around on as getonomics, or getonomics, sorry, rather, which looks rather at a pair individual sus genetic susceptibility to develop disease and how the environment interacts with them. So epigenetics. And over the course of an individual's lifetime, how this either damages the lungs or fix the development or aging process. So you can't obviously screen everyone for COPD. And as with all things in medicine, you've got to investigate appropriately. So you normally look at the appropriate clinical context, uh, most commonly patients who are presenting with shortness of breath and a wheeze. Unlike asthma, we do need spirometry to confirm airflow limitation. It's not only based on um, symptoms alone. And the golden number is if you want FEC of less than 0 0.7, uh, you know, just commit this to memory. I think all the way from students, all the way up to consultants, always need revision of, of uh, interpretation spirometry. So it certainly is something I would encourage. And there has been a new guideline released by the South African Thoracic Society on office spirometry and how to interpret it. So I would encourage you to go and read those. These is two entities of pre-COPD and PRISM, which is basically patients who have disease or physiologic abnormality without evidence of airflow obstruction. So in IE, the ratio is normal. So pre-COPD patients have a ratio, FEV1, FEC ratio of more than 0.7, but you may notice that FEV1 is lower than 80% of predicted or the lower limit of normal if you're using the new GLI um, reference ranges. And then there's also entity called PRISM, which is preserved ratio with impaired spirometry. So these are patients who have 
reduce FEV1, a rapid decline in FEV1. And if we opt to do full lung functions, looking at petrosmography and the transfer factor of carbon monoxide, we'll find that they have increased residual volume, which is an indicator of airflow, um, rather hyperinflation in air trapping, as well as a lower or reduced DLCO, which indicates parenchymal and alveolar damage affecting your transfer factor of carbon monoxide. Chronic bronchitis has now come back in vogue. Um, I remember as a student, it would always be mentioned, uh, I guess, in hushed tones, but never really put forward as a subcategory of COPD, but it is becoming more recognized now. It is common but variable. And the definition is a cough and sputum production for at least three months per year for two consecutive years. And importantly, you need to exclude any other conditions that may be contributing to this cough. And as I said, it's coming a bit more back into vogue, but the definition hasn't changed, I think, for the last 10 to 20 years, but it is now being more recognized. So this is probably one of the most interesting and I think exciting additions to the new guideline. It's where we've got this new taxonomy for COPD. And all they really is is they've added a suffix to the COPD diagnosis to indicate what the etiology is. So whereas we would normally write COPD secondary to smoking, if you look at the third row, it will now be COPD-C showing that it's secondary to smoking. And I think the, the smoking and the biomass and pollution exposure are probably the biggest that we see in our setting. If you look at the infections, it is now at least important, or at least it's being recognized that TB and HIV are contributors towards the development of COPD. Um, you know, I think in talks of yours, you speak about TB, TB OPD. And yeah. recently in a talk that uh, Prof. Allward from Stellenbosch gave us, he also, they also showed that there is a lot of airflow limitation in patients who have post-TB bronchiectasis. So it's really fantastic that it's now been adopted on international stage. Um, HIV is an independent risk factor for the development of COPD, even with a suppressed viral load and a good CD4 count. In terms of other etiologies, yeah, I think we do have a few alpha-1 antitrypsin patients floating around our clinic, uh, but as we don't really see a lot of the others. All in all, we're really just creating more alphabet soup for ourselves. So how do we find patients? Um, so as with all things, you've got to be appropriate in your investigation. So there's no point in screening asymptomatic individuals, no exposures. That's just a waste of money and resources. Obviously, patients have symptoms and risk factors, which I'll discuss a little bit later. There's a much better diagnostic yield in terms of spirometry there. And also in these patients, importantly, your FEV1 and FEC predict your mortality independent of your smoking status. So even if your patients stop smoking, if they have a low baseline FEV1 and FEC, their mortality is still higher. Animal lung functions can predict those who are at risk for developing lung cancer. Um, and the data for population-based screening is very weak. So if we had to take everyone in this room and ask them to do spirometry, the chance of picking up anyone with the uh, Animal lung function will be low. And again, it's not worth the time and effort. And I know none of us in this room are smokers, so we're definitely not going to pick up anyone with COPD. Mm -hmm. Novel approaches that have been postulated, these I think are a lot more easier to do in countries where they have electronic uh, medical records, because you can go back and look at patients who may have exposures, uh, or well, exposure rather, I should rather say, would be particularly appropriate in occupational settings. Um, you know, the mines do yearly medical on their patients, and we often get patients referred from the NIOH as well as from the mines for evaluation. Um, symptoms, health utilization, and peak flow. So these are good to look at, like I said, in terms of patients have electronic medical records. We can see patients, why they're presented to the emergency departments, how often are they coming through. And most patients should have a peak flow when they come in with respiratory symptoms. And you can go back, which is basically look any one of the abnormal peak flow you can comb them back for formal spirometry. Um, and this slide just indicates, you know, when you could consider a patient for diagnosis of COPD. Uh, you can all read, so I'm not gonna delve too much into it, but I think the two most common features that we see are dyspnea and the recurrent wheeze, and obviously in an appropriate setting in terms of risk factors. If you remember back to the table I showed you in terms of the taxonomy, they did account for a COPD of unknown etiology, COPDU. So don't forget that just because your patient doesn't have a recognizable exposure or the one that you can elicit doesn't mean that they can't have a diagnosis of COPD. Then just in terms of our grading of our dyspnea, I think we're all familiar with the MMRC or the Modified Medical Research Council dyspnea score, as well as the COPD assessment tool. I prefer the MMRC. I think it's a lot easier in a, you know, in a clinical setting to just ask the patient how they're doing. And it's very simple and has specific measures to use. The CDO 
CAT or the CAT assessment is a little bit better because it gives a bit more holistic view of your patient. So it doesn't just look at their dyspnea. You know, if you look at the parameters, they think about speak of things like sleep, energy, and also focus on psych psychological things such as I'm confident leaving my home despite my lung condition. So it's a bit more all-encompassing and look at your patient a bit more holistically. However, this needs to be given the patient, given to the patient before the consultation. And you know, unfortunately, it's only available in English currently. So maybe a bit difficult in our setting to translate to our patients. So as we say, all that wheezes is not asthma. Similarly, all that coughs is not COPD. Please always think about other causes of a chronic cough. For me, I will never forget this. The second question in my pulmonology oral exam was Prof Wong asking me, me about the cause of a chronic cough. So certainly this table will stick in my mind. And I ask you also to please just consider other causes of uh, a chronic cough. So other differentials that you need to consider in terms of COPD is listed here. Again, I'm not gonna go too much into detail here. These are available in the guidelines and you guys can read. So I don't wanna bore you with that. Just to point out two particular entities, the first one being obliterative bronchiolitis. We are seeing a greater incidence of this now, especially in the post-COVID era. Patients coming in complaining of dyspnea, you know, three, four, five, six months after the COVID infection, even with mild infection. And only once we either do spirometry or computerized tomography, do we see that they do have elements of obliterative bronchiolitis. Uh, so just keep that in mind. And diffuse pan bronchiolitis is honestly not seen outside out, um, outside of Japan. So maybe not things that we commonly see, or rather that's not something that we commonly see. So, you know, moving on from that, this was a new addition to the 2023 guidelines in that we should probably be using more CT in our COPD patients. The reason being, it gives us a bit more insight into structural lung damage and how it relates to pathophysiological abnormalities. And we can also see the extent of structural disease and how it relates either to spirometric, spirometric abnormalities, as well as patients' perception of their dyspnea. Um, the third point, as it mentions, that we can, there's also certain interventional procedures that we can do, um, either from a surgical standpoint or interventional bronchoscopy standpoint. Unfortunately, Stellenbosch and UCT at Kutuski are the only uh, places at the moment to offer endobronchial valve placement or coils. And any good cardiothoracic unit should be able to offer volume reduction surgery. As I mentioned before, um, you know, or rather a rapid FE1 decline increases your likelihood of cancer, as well as the presence of emphysema on a, lung, on a CT increases your likelihood of developing cancer, which is quite a scary thought. And linked to that, you can also find other comorbidities such as concurrent bronchiectasis. And I'll explain a little bit later why that is important, but we also know it will increase exacerbation frequency and mortality. And sometimes you may detect airway disease even if your spirometry is normal. And you know, at this point, I just want to point out that if you are ordering high-risk CTs, which you will probably for your COPD patients, if you are going to order them, please always ask for inspiratory and expiratory views. And I'll demonstrate why in this uh, over here. So this is a patient who I am actually seeing, or we're following up at our clinic. Um, this is a patient who presented again with symptoms post-COVID. Um, that is a, and she's got a normal spirometry, normal DLCO, normal split seismography, and a good six minute walk. You can see this is inspired review, looks relatively normal, probably be able to pass off is fine. But if we can see on our expired review, we can see the changes with the mosaicism, and these hyperlucent areas are all areas of air trapping. So, had we not got an expired review, we would have completely missed this diagnosis. And she is being treated for obliterative bronchiolitis and is responding well to inhaled corticosteroids. So this shows the importance of please, I think every time you order high-risk CT for any patient, inspiratory, expiratory views, and ideally prone and supine. But any good radiologist should do that though. Um, so when will we use CT, uh, CT in a stable COPD? Uh, just to look for any differential diagnoses. Um, if we're considering any patient for lung volume reduction or any intervention, where we look at the distribution of disease and how homogeneous or heterogeneous it is, as well as for lung cancer screening because you may also pick it up. All right, so vaccinations are important. Anyone who's been around with Prof Richards will know that he's a big advocate for um, vaccines. He will ask who hasn't had the vaccine and then ask them what is wrong with you. So he's normally a big advocate for the influenza vaccine. Um, COVID obviously in our current pandemic is important. Pneumococcal has always been part of the recommendations. Um, recently added, I think it was in 2021, is the use of the pertussis vaccine, and the CDC has actually incorporated that in America into their expanded program of immunization for adults also. 
just one thing I would like to point out in terms of pneumococcal vaccine, here the recommendation is to use the 20 valent conjugate vaccine or the 15. Unfortunately, we don't have that available in South Africa yet, and we have the PCV13. All right, then Prof Feldman, I think international expert on pneumococcal disease and the pneumococcal vaccine, and I hope by doing him proud by putting in the slide. So who qualifies for the vaccine? Any adult over the age of 65, any adult aged between 19 and 64 with an underlying medical condition. And these include things such as chronic lung conditions, including COPD, those with a sodal organ transplant, um, those with chronic kidney disease or a chronic heart failure. And the two vaccines, as I said, available in South Africa are the PCV13 and the polysaccharide vaccine or the PPSV23 uh, valent. Which order should you give the vaccines in? Ideally, the 13 should be given first, and then the, or the conjugate vaccine 13 should be given first, and the polysaccharide 23 afterwards. Some patients, unfortunately, may have gotten the 23 beforehand. That's what we have really available in the state sector. But not to despair, the patients can still take the 13 at least one year after their last uh, PAPSV 23 dose. And this normally should give them protection for at least four to five years. Not an update, but certainly an important discussion point in COPD, the use of inhaled corticosteroids. Um, it was actually, again, in the 2021 um, update where they put out very strong recommendations in terms of who would benefit from the use of steroids and who shouldn't. So in terms of strongly flavored, uh, sorry, strongly, strongly favored use, um, are those with recurrent hospitalizations or exacerbations. Importantly, a blood inosifinal count of more than 300 uh, cells per microliter, which in our reference ranges is 0.3 cells per deciliter and anyone with a history or is suffering from concomitant asthma which is in line with the GINA guidelines. Favors use uh, you know neither here nor there I think you'll have to decide in a clinical setting whether there's any benefit so those that maybe have one moderate exacerbation per year or the eosinophil count between 100 to 300 and then strongly against the use and very relevant in our setting is those who have repeated uh, pneumonia events, as well as those of the history of mycobacterial infection, which is really the majority of our patients. Not majority, rather. Uh, you know, we do tend to see a lot of patients who would have had a history of mycobacterial infection. So what therapeutic interventions have been shown to reduce mortality? So obviously, first line is our pharmacological therapy, which are our inhalers, and I'll expand on that uh, a little bit later. Then non-pharmacological therapy, um, smoking cessation, I think, speaks for itself reduces exacerbations, reduces FEV1, FEV1 decline, as well as reduces your lung cancer risk. Pulmonary rehabilitation is particularly a big thing overseas where they have separate respiratory uh, physiotherapists. Um, and the benefit has been shown that patients either were admitted or up to four weeks post-discharge who start a pulmonary rehabilitation program have an improved quality of life as well as reduced mortality. Long-term oxygen therapy, um, you know, we all know the benefits of this decreases mortality. Patients who qualify are those with resting oxygen sets of less than 88%, which equates to a pulmonary um, arterial uh, oxygen pressure of 55 millimeters of mercury. You can also, there is also benefit for those who have uh, PaO2 of between 55 to 60 and evidence of core pulmonale or polycythemia. Unfortunately, in our setting, due to the limitation of resources, it's only those who have a set of less than 88% to currently qualify. Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation helps in patients who are hypercapnic, uh, both inpatient and outpatient. Lung volume reduction surgery, which I'll expand on the next slide, and lung transplantation, which unfortunately is not available um, in our state setting. In private, you will be able to access it. And again, in Krutuskia, in a state sector, they are doing lung transplants. I wouldn't say that many, but at least they are doing. So the interventional therapy, a um, bit more directed, I guess, at the fellows and pulmonologists, but I think still useful for all of us to know that this is available as an adjunct to non-pharmacological, uh, as an adjunct of non-pharmacological therapy. So if you are struggling to treat your patients with inhalers, as well as modifying any external or non-pharmacological factors, and you're still not winning, just call up your friendly neighborhood pulmonologist, and they will be able to assess whether your patient will benefit from any interventional procedures. So probably the mainstay of uh, COPD treatment is our inhalers. And why is it so complex? There's 33 different inhalers, which are all put together in some combination in 22 different devices. Over and above that, the different type of inhalers, which I've listed there, 
the meter dose inhalers and the dry powder inhalers are one we most commonly use. And you can get adjuncts to those, which will help the patient to use that. So spaces or valve hold, uh, holding chambers. She just quickly shows some examples of the inhaler. So this is a meter dose inhaler. It gives a fixed dose of each decompression of the canister. On the right-hand side of the screen, we can see various devices, which are the valve holding chambers and the spaces, uh, which are typically used with your MDIs, just to help the patient to use their medication. And I'll expand on that uh, later. Then we get our dry powder inhalers. I think the ones we most favor or we've commonly seen are the ones in A and B, which is uh, Spireva and Seabree come in those formulations. And in terms of C and E on the picture on the left, uh, those are the turbo inhalers, which is Symbicort, which is currently used quite extensively at the moment. Um, D represents a blister pack or blister dry powder inhaler, which Serotide and Cero, um, Serotide used to come in and Foxy, which we don't have available anymore. Softness inhalers, must be honest, I've never seen it yet, but this is available, but I don't think we really have any softness inhalers in South Africa. Another important point of the inhalers, despite just which type you choose, is also the size of the particles that they um, dispense. Uh, and we want most of our particles to either dispense in the, uh, sorry, my pointer, in the conducting areas of all the alveoli. And kind of the nice middle ground is the five microns. Um, that would be our good, uh, good aim. Uh, anything less than two, which some dispensers do give deposits a bit too much, the oral ferry, uh, we see deposits a bit too much more in the alveoli rather than the bronchial and conducting airway. So between two and five is kind of the golden number for us. And most inhalers dispense particles of those size. There are a lot of factors that affect a patient's ability to use the meter dose inhaler. So the inspiratory flow that they need to generate either to, to um, activate the inhaler, particularly with your dry powder inhalers, as well as a flow acceleration they can develop in order to um, basically activate the inhaler as well as the inhaled volumes. You know, some patients, if you look at the force vital capacities, are very minimal, sometimes even less than a liter. So they're not taking a very good uh, volume of air, and therefore the distribution of the inhaled of the inhaler particles are not that great. Then cognitive ability also plays a role. If your patient doesn't understand how to use the inhaler, you know, that doesn't help out. The dexterity, coordination, and hand strength, um, you know, to, in order to depress the inhaler and breathing at the same time, particularly when using your meter dose inhalers. And that's expanded on in the next point there, that MDIs need a slow, deep inspiration. Your patient needs to be able to hold their breath for a long time, as well as a coordination of depressing the canister and breathing in at the same time. Though, the very simple example is to tell your patient, use your inhaler like you're taking a puff of your cigarette. <laughs> DPIs require a bit more forceful inspiration, as I said, to pull the powder out, either of the canister or the blister pack. And patients then may require spaces or valve holding chambers with your meter dose inhalers. So basically, they depress the canister, the particles sit in the spacer, and they, they breathe in and out as they normally would. And it allows then for the um, drug to be distributed. We normally use it in kids, but in patients with very severe COPD or those who can't coordinate, we can also use those. And if all else fails, you can always use nebulizers. It's not the first prize because the size of the particles are a little bit bigger um, and they don't distribute where we would like them to in the terms of the conducting airways. But if it's all you have available and your patient really can't use inhalers, you can uh, give them nebulizers. This is just a graph from a study that was done which shows the wide variety of flow, uh, inflatory flow rates that you need in order to use your inhalers. And you can see it varies anything from 20 if you look at the first column with your PMDI, your pressure meter dose inhaler up to 50 with the breeze inhaler, which is second from the bottom. So as I said, all the different inhalers have different requirements in terms of usage, which makes it complicated for patients. So adherence is always something, I think, not necessarily only for pulmonology, but throughout uh, medicine that we're always looking for in terms of adherence to medication. Studies have shown that adherence ranges from 22 to 93%, so from the very poor to the very good. Obviously, the benefits, as stated in the first point, uh, are obvious, um, but there are a lot of factors that relate to how adherent a patient is with the medication. So person-related factors, again, we spoke about cognitive abilities, um, where they can coordinate, where they have enough hand strength. You know, if you've got a patient with rheumatoid arthritis who has concomitant COPD, they not be able to necessarily use the inhaler properly. Social environmental factors also play a big role. So, um, you know, poor, uh, lower income, uh, inability to get to the hospital to take treatment, treatment outages, which is unfortunately something 
very common in our setting. Patients always come back and say, um, you know, this medication was not available, so pharmacy didn't give it to me and I haven't had it for the last five months. Treatment-related factors are important. The size and portability of the inhaler, how many steps it requires to use it, um, as well as side effects from the inhalers. And then healthcare provider and caregiver factors are also important. Um, the lung tech the other day came to ask me, you know, who actually shows the patients how to use inhalers. Because she's noticed that when doing spirometry and doing a false bronchodilator spirometry, that most of the patients don't know how to use the Astavent um, inhalers. So, you know, it, it's important for us to also know how to use our inhalers um, and also make sure at every visit that we teach our patients how to use it, just like we do in our asthma patients. At every visit, the COPD patient's inhaler technique should also be checked. Um, yeah, and I think it mustn't be passed on to the next person to do it. I think we all prescribe and expect pharmacy to show, but pharmacy is seeing a thousand patients. They don't have time to show the patient how to use inhalers. So take the time to show a patient how to use inhaler. And every time you dispense a new inhaler, uh, make sure you show the patient how to use it. You know, if you're adding a new inhaler or changing the inhaler therapy that they're taking, make sure you show them how to use it. And that obviously means that we need to know how to use it. Um, again, a flow diagram or rather list from the COPD update. Uh, again, I'm not going to bore you too much with going through it. Just this point here I want to highlight, which again shows that you need to look at your patient's ability to use inhaler. Again, dry powder inhalers need a forceful inhalation to use, whereas the meter dose inhalers then require coordination. And if you're not winning there, then you use your space or your valve holding chambers, valved hold chambers, holding chambers rather. And then if your patient can't use either, then as the last point states in that block that you should then consider a nebulizer. Then that point there, physicians should only prescribe devices that they and other members of the caring team know how to use, which reiterates my previous point. Uh, legend has it that in one of the oral exams for pulmonology, they gave the fellows a box of inhalers and they had to demonstrate how to use it. So we take it very seriously. And I think you should also. <laughs> So this is the initial pharmacological treatment of COPD. And before we get there, I think everyone will notice, at least those who read the guidelines for the last two years, that group C and D have now fallen away and now been replaced with group E, which I think is really great. The rationale behind this being that they felt that patients who have recurrent exacerbations really shouldn't be stratified according to their symptoms. It really didn't show to pretend any benefit in terms of outcome and exacerbations going forward. So they've just lumped them into one big group called group E. So now for the registrars, when you're giving your COPD assessment, it's COPD with another letter and then gold, either A, B, or E. And I think it's very self-explanatory, at least, and been a lot more simplified. Group A uh, uses a short acting bronchodilator. Beta agonist preferred, um, uh, or beta, sorry. Yeah, beta agonist preferred over, um, your anticholinergics, group B, dual therapy preferred over monotherapy in terms of your long-acting beta agonists or your long-acting anticholinergics. Group E, as you can see, is similar to group B, mainly for the reason that your anticholinergics also have some anti-inflammatory properties. So that is felt to help reduce exacerbations. And then lastly, you can consider adding an inhaled corticosteroid if you see the small subtext there, if the blood eosinophils are more than 300, because we know well, those patients will benefit from the health corticosteroid in terms of reducing their excess number of exacerbations. Once your patient is then stable on their treatment, you then kind of modify your treatment based on two flow diagrams, shall we say. So either whether your patient is very dysnic, in which case, if you're using monotherapy, move on to dual therapy, or you can switch out perhaps your LAMA for your LABA. And if you start using dual therapy, then you need to then look for alternate things. So uh, maybe look for non-pharmacological interventions that you could use or investigate to treat for other causes of dyspnea. If we look at the exacerbation side, so these are patients who are, have frequent admissions or frequent visits to the emergency department. Again, if they're on monotherapy, blood diosinophil counts more than 300, very simple, just gone to triple therapy. Most of our patients at our clinic, I think on um, majority of them on triple therapy. Blood use of account less than 300, uh, switch from mono to dual therapy. If you're still not winning and your blood use of account is more than 100, then you switch to triple therapy. However, if your count is less than 100, then you can consider your oral agents. So, Raflulumast, uh, which is a phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor, 
azithromycin, which has shown a particular benefit in patients who have uh, who are current smokers or especially former smokers. Importantly, in those patients, please exclude non-tuberculous mycobacteria before initiating azithromycin, and also make sure you get a baseline ECG in those patients. Non-pharmacological management, I think I've uh, gone through this already, but essential smoking cessation, physical activity, and obviously your um, uh, vaccinations, which will be tailored to local guidelines, but these are the recommended vaccines. So COPD exacerbation, this definition has also been updated. So currently it's a change in symptoms, which include dyspnea, cough, and sputum production that have worsened in the last 14 days almost coming very much in line with our definition of a bronchiectasis exacerbation. It may be also be accompanied by other features such as tachypnea and tachycardia. And always, as we always, uh, sorry, rather, as we always emphasize, please look for precipitant so we can address those um, why the patient is exacerbating. Also important always to look at confounders or differential diagnoses. Uh, when patients are presenting with COPD exacerbation, pneumonia being both a confounder and a contributor, pulmonary embolus again being a confounder and a contributor. And this is probably something that we ignore quite a bit. You know, they found that in up to 40% of patients, 30 to 40% of patients who present with a COPD exacerbation, that a PE is found in those patients as a precipitant. So it's something that you should consider. They do recommend CT angio as the uh, investigation of choice. I think we all know the challenges we have with radiography. Uh, in our setting, so if you have, do have access to a nuclear medicine at your hospital, a VQ scan is just as effective. Then the last three, heart failure, pneumothoraces, effusions, as well as the MI or any cardiac event, um, those would probably be other differentials to consider. So don't only stop at, you know, this being COPD. Look for other things that the patient may be at risk at. And this fairly simple investigation so that can exclude all of these. How do we classify the severity of exacerbation? So before it used to be retrospectively classified, which was a bit counterintuitive. So your, your severity was classified according to how well you responded to treatment and what you required to get better. And it's anything from short acting bronchodilators uh, to requiring a visit to the hospital. And the problem with this is most patients aren't going to report a mild severity. So the incidence may be underestimated. Uh, if your patient got better with their bronchodilator at home, they're not really going to tell you that at their visit unless you really pry them. So this wasn't a very practical method of uh, assessing severity. So this is a new proposed mechanism or classification for exacerbation. And this is an update to the new guideline uh, based mainly on your clinical assessment of the patient. So the dyspnea VAS is a visual score. So you look at how the patient's breathing, are they using accessory muscles, tripoding, et cetera, and looking at your important vitals, so respiratory rate, heart rate, oxygen saturation, and if available, an arterial blood gas, looking at your oxygenation, your CO2 levels, as well as your pH. Again, always determine the etiology, as shown on the last uh, box on the right, on the left hand side of the slide, and the right hand side. Always consider other differentials. So obviously, we want to know how to manage COPD exacerbations, but for that, you'll have to please register for the CME to coincidentally come to my talk on COPD exacerbations and management in the ICU. So please, everyone. Don't forget to register. No, I'm just kidding. All right. So we're going to discuss severe a treatment of severe exacerbations, but I'm not going to go into life-threatening because that's a lot of ICU stuff. And I think that's a talk entirely on its own. So in all honesty, do come to the CME, please. All right. So this is a nice basic overview. And I think something very simple for us to uh, follow, um, just to highlight in terms of bronchodilators, Short acting is considered, uh, short acting beta agonists are considered first line with or without anticholinergic. So you don't need to be anticholinergic. Uh, beta agonists by itself would be useful. Um, consider long acting bronchodilators when patients become stable. So patients who are admitted, we always encourage them to continue their chronic therapy while in hospital, provided they can manage it. Or we try to initiate long acting therapy as soon as possible in hospital. Then to look at a few other points, so oral corticosteroids shown to improve oxygenation, decrease length of stay, as well as reduce the decline in the FEV1. Dosing, uh, you know, Prof Altman, I think, gave a talk last year on personalized COPD medication, and currently we say 0.5 milligrams per, per kilogram, um, not to exceed more than 40 milligrams of prednisone per day. And the duration is normally for about five days, obviously um, taking into account the side effects, but duration should not be more than 
five days and like i said maximum of 40 milligrams of prednisone per day after that you just start getting side effects as demonstrated by this little cartoon here all right oral antibiotics should be given when bacterial infection or you suspect that there's bacterial infection this can sometimes be a bit difficult in our COPD patients, so they may not clinically or on radiographical evaluation manifest any signs of um, sepsis or bacterial infection. And currently, the guidelines recommend that we should be using biochemical markers to guide our decision in terms of using antibiotics. And surprisingly, CRP has actually performed better than PCT in this regard. So they found that CRP reduced antibiotic use from 77% or inappropriate antibiotic use from 77% to 43% in some studies. And PCT, surprisingly, in one study in an ICU, they used PCT guided use of antibiotics, and there was actually an increased mortality rate when using PCT. So please use CRP. The cutoff, we say more than 40, treat for infection, less than 40, probably just some other precipitant that's causing this exacerbation. Antibiotics, the big benefits here, reduces the risk of relapse, uh, reduces sputum production as well as symptoms, and also reduces hospital stay. Then looking at non-invasive ventilation, um, something I think we're all normally pretty scared to initiate um, in terms of, I guess, due to our resource limited settings, which is uh, a sub point or a footnote on the slide here, local resources need to be considered. But ideally, uh, uh, patients who qualify for NIV are those who have increased work of breathing, so using the respiratory muscles, becoming exhausted, uh, becoming confused, even um, those who have a respiratory acidosis, which they goal defined as a PO, uh, pH of less than 1.35, with a PO2 of PaCO2 of more than 45, all patients are also becoming hypoxic uh, despite supplemental oxygen. And the scary thing, if we look at those parameters, that's probably, again, the majority of patients that we get called to casualty or coming to the ward. But again, due to our limited resources, we always can't use NIV in these patients. NIV is really fantastic, though. It's the first line of supportive ventilation use or the suggested first line in COPD patients. Success rate is 80 to 85%. So it is really, really good. It decreases work of breathing, increases oxygenation. Your patients feel better. It improves their acidosis as well as the hypercapnia, reduces hospital stays and also reduces the need to go on to invasive mechanical ventilation, which is always a plus. One thing which I find very interesting, and I think maybe it can give us a bit of reassurance, um, you know, if you've got NIV, patients at NIV in, in casualty, is that they say if your patient is able to cope for four hours off NIV, you actually don't need a weaning period. So if you stop the NIV for four hours and your patient copes, you can take them straight to the ward without needing to wean them, but kind of where we do the four hours off, four hours on. All right, when should you send your patient? When should you call ICU or pulmonology um, if you're working or rather at Charlotte's particularly because we have a pulmonology department or if you need assistance if you've had one of your other hospitals. So if your patient's not responding to therapy, they're becoming very confused. Um, they worsening their blood gas parameters are worsening in terms of hypoxia and hypercapnia or if they need any now needing organ support in the form of invasive mechanical ventilation or vasopressors. Then the last point I want to touch on is comorbidities in COPD. Some of which are complication of the disease, some of which are associated with the disease, and some of them which have shared risk factors. And that's why I've opened up with the cardiovascular comorbidities. I think these commonly go together because one of the big causes of COPD is smoking. And smoking, we know, is also at increases for a lot of cardiovascular disease. Just a few points, I'm just going to touch on each of these, or well, a few of them in terms of important points when treating them with concomitant COPD. So in terms of ischemic heart disease, a patient who is admitted with a COPD exacerbation to a hospital has a 90-day increased risk of cardiovascular events. So 90 days after the discharge, they had increased risk of cardiovascular events, whether it be death, an MI, a transit ischemic attack, or heart failure. So, you know, again, the exacerbations, which is something we need to prevent, have a big, um, shall we say, uh, downstream effect in terms of cardiovascular event. Arrhythmias, patients with COPD have arrhythmias. This is probably due to the changes in pulmonary vasculature that result in increased uh, right heart strain with subsequent dilatation of your RV and your RA, which then become full site for um, arrhythmic events. The biggest concern in this case was always that we thought our bronchodilators were arrhythmogenic, but subsequent studies have shown this not to be true. 
there is a bit of a proviso in terms of using uh, excessive use of your short acting bronchodilators, as well as theophylline or your methyl xanthines. So use those in caution. We don't really use methyl xanthines anymore. It's not recommended, um, especially in, in acute exacerbation management. And in chronic management, it's really kind of if you're really struggling, but I don't think it's commonly used. And patients who aren't theophylline are those who may have been historically on it who we just haven't opted to change or they have some who feel they're getting benefit from it. Hypertension, biggest problem with hypertension, if you've got systolic or other diastolic dysfunction, that the symptoms may mimic uh, that of COPD. And this holds true for all cardiovascular disease. It's always difficult sometimes to tease out whether the symptoms are due to the cardiovascular disease or the COPD itself. In terms of heart failure, the big thing is we know that especially in reduced ejection fraction, heart failure, beta blockers form the backbone of treatment for there. And there's always the this concern is beta blocker safety using patients with COPD. So it's actually been shown that beta one blockers or selective beta one blockers actually decrease exacerbation risk in COPD. And if your patient has heart failure, they should be with COPD, they should be on a beta one, selective beta one blocker. However, in the absence of heart failure, you shouldn't be using beta one blockers in COPD patients. So please, it's only if they have concomitant heart failure that you use it, don't use it as an adjunct to reduce exacerbations. And peripheral vascular disease, I think, speaks to itself in terms of the smoking and atherogenic, uh, increased risk of uh, atherogenic events. So the other big comorbidity then is that obviously of lung cancer, which are patients mainly due to the smoking risk, quite increased risk for lung cancer development, but also if they have emphysema on the CT as well as airflow limitation of less than 0.7 ratio which in all honesty all our patients will have because that's part of the diagnostic criteria for COPD. Then lastly these are the list of some of the other common comorbidities associated with um, COPD. Um, the ones in bold I just want to highlight on. So uh, comorbid bronchiectasis is important because in these patients due to the structural lung disease you may be a bit more hesitant or have to use a bit more caution in terms of using inhaled corticosteroid in these patients. Gastroesophageal gastroesophageal reflux disease is an independent cause of exacerbations in these patients. So please, if your patient has symptoms of cord, please treat them with a PPI. Then the last three in the right-hand column, I've just wanted to point out, because I think these are sometimes things that we forget about a lot, uh, you know, the psychological and the neurological impact of COPD. So patients, the anxiety and depression, you know, these are patients who have now have lost a lot of independence. Um, they've effort tolerance is now being reduced. They need people to assist them. They're stuck on their oxygen at home. So obviously a lot of anxiety or other depression will creep in. Anxiety relates into, oh, how am I going to cope now if I go to the shop? I need to go to the hospital for my follow-up. I'm going to park near Nelson Mandela's children hospital and need to walk almost two kilometers to get to the clinic. So these are all issues that affect these patients. And you know, anxiety and depression then also affects adherence to therapy. Cognitive impairment is also something that affects adherence to therapy and frailty. Again, these patients aren't getting up and about, um, so they're not really, uh, yeah, they aren't getting up and about, so they develop losing muscle mass, uh, becoming sarcopenic. So this all then contributes also then to uh, their comorbid condition and, you know, pulmonary rehabilitation, for instance, in these patients then becomes problematic. All right, so I would like to thank everyone for taking time out to come today. And uh, the floor is now open to any questions, comments, or complaints. Thanks for a really excellent overview of 